Good morning, everybody. I'm Andrew Stolpe, the Director of Oregon's Department of Consumer and Business Services. I want to thank each of you for joining our agency this morning. Uh, welcome two speakers from the Oregon Historical Society. Uh, OHS is one of Oregon's treasured public resources and is dedicated to putting the power of history into everyone's hands. Today, we're fortunate to hear from Kerry Tuchuk, the OHS Executive Director, and Eliza Canty Jones, the editor of the OHS Quarterly. They're going to lead us through a webinar they created titled Race in Oregon A Historical Perspective. Over the last few months, as we've dealt with issues of social justice, violence against people of color, and criminal justice reform, we've learned that it's not enough to just have empathy. Rather, we must all take thoughtful and informed action and urge our leaders to do the same. An important first step in this can be accomplished by listening and learning, not only so we avoid the mistakes of our past, but so we can better understand all of those around us. Simply put, we're understanding how both racism and justice are at the heart of Oregon's history are crucial in building a better future for all of Oregon. We're so glad we can continue our conversation today with Carrie and Eliza. And before we dive in, just give you a little background on our two presenters. Carrie is a fifth generation Oregonian from Reedsport. Prior to assuming the helm at OHS in 2011, Carrie earned a bipartisan reputation as one of Oregon's most respected public servants. His CV is too long to recite, but give you some highlights. And Carrie's been the speechwriter for US Secretary of Labor Elizabeth Dole and for US Senator Bob Dole. Served as Oregon Chief of Staff to Senator Gordon Smith, and like one of our own staff members, has appeared on Jeopardy, who is a four time champion. <laughs> Eliza produces scholarship, public programs, and organizational partnerships that advance complex perspectives on Oregon's past and that help surface histories of white supremacy, settler colonialism, resistance to oppression, and community building. She was co founder and served as president of the Oregon Women's History Consortium which created the statewide centennial project, Century of Action, Oregon Women Vote 1912 to 2012. We are very, very fortunate to have Carrie and Eliza with us this morning. So without further ado, please, warn, please join me in a warm virtual welcome to our colleagues from the Oregon Historical Society. Well, thank you, Andrew, and uh, for inviting us today. And for all those, uh, I can already see that there's already over 400 participants online for, uh, for, for being part of this. Uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, quotes is the great historian David McCullough, who once said that history is who we are and why we are the way we are. History is who we are and why we are the way we are. And I think our goal today, and Eliza can, will, will follow up on this, is, is to help uh, explain that and the fact that uh, Oregon today is, is part of who we are and why we are the way we are from the history of the past. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, some some historical facts that perhaps many of you don't know and, and many of you will be surprised about giving Oregon's image today as a very progressive state. And uh, our goal today is to not make you feel guilty or responsible for what happened 150 or 100 years ago or 50 years ago, but to make sure that you know and appreciate what happened those years ago and understand it and, and how it affects Oregon even today. Mm -hmm. Eliza, anything to add on to that? No, perfect as usual. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> um, we'll go ahead and jump right in and then I wanna let folks know our goal is to try and finish up within about 40 minutes so that there's some time for Q&A and you can use the chat and the, the Q&A for that we probably won't be looking at it while we're presenting because we'll be focused on our notes, um, but we'll be eager to look at those um, when we're done and excited to answer your questions. So we will just jump right in. Um, we uh, often recognize the fact that we're on indigenous land. Wherever we are in Oregon, it's indigenous land. And really uh, those of us who spend some time learning about the history of this land have to understand that, that most of us, those of us who are not indigenous to this place are here really because of the theft of that land. So I'm coming to you from Portland, which is located on the traditional homelands of the Multnomah, Kaplamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Wallala bands of the Chinook, 
the Tualatin Calapuya, and many other nations of the indigenous river, of the Columbia River, excuse me. And I'm sure all of you from across Oregon have some sense of the tribes and bands whose ancestral homelands are where you live and work. And we really encourage folks to spend some time learning about that. I've got the covers of three excellent books uh, that give you some really great context for national history, um, particularly looking at the doctrine of discovery, which is what um, Bob Miller's book on Native America, Discovered and Conquered is about. This is a centuries old legal doctrine that provides the framework for the taking of land from people who were not civilized or Christian. Um, and then Jeffrey Osler's new book, Surviving Genocide, is the first in two volumes. The next one will be out sometime in the future and will look even farther to the West than this one, but really looking at this history of genocide in a complex scholarly way that helps us understand how genocide is part of our history as the United States and its relationship to Native nations. Um, and then, of course, uh, local history here in Oregon. As Days Go By is a book the Oregon Historical Society was really privileged to participate in publishing. It's the history of the tribes who are now gathered at Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Indian Reservation. And we just always encourage folks to use our resources and use the resources created by tribes here in Oregon to learn about that ancestral and ongoing relationship to the places where we are. Um, and I would add there, there are currently there are nine federally recognized tribes headquartered in Oregon. Now, we worked with each of these tribes very closely as we developed a new permanent exhibit at OHS, which we opened last year called Experience Oregon, wanting to make sure that we were telling their story, their history, their story correctly. And it was interesting, the uh, most common uh, thought and request they had as we worked with them was, uh, Yes, of course, the exhibit recognizes that, that they were here first. Uh, mm -hmm. by, by time immemorial, the Native Americans, the indigenous people were here long, long before anybody else. But they wanted us to also make the point that they are still here. And they mentioned there are so many museums uh, in the West where there are the Native Americans, the indigenous people, here come the pioneers, the settlers, the cowboys, and there go the indigenous people, and they're never mentioned again in the exhibit. Uh, we did not make that mistake in, in, our, in our exhibit. The Experience Oregon, the, the story of the Native Americans, Indigenous people are, is told throughout the exhibit uh, from time immemorial to, to present day. So the, the, this is a sign that we think helps set a good tone for what we're going to talk about today. Uh, this was from a protest for Black Lives Matter in Salem just a couple of months ago. Oregon has a racist history, let's not have a racist future, uh, which is just another way of saying what Carrie said earlier. Uh, we always like to quote Dr. Daryl Milner, who says we are not responsible for the past, but we are responsible for our relationship with the past. And I can't tell you how fun it is um, in many ways to see people bringing the context of Oregon history to their advocacy and their discussions about public policy and change today. That latter part of it is of course not what we do, but we are more than happy to provide the history that helps people make those good decisions. All right, this is the interactive part to begin with. Uh, we think that one of the ways of understanding the past is really thinking about what are the myths, right? Um, oftentimes we think about what we have to unlearn instead of in order to relearn a new thing. So we really wanna invite you all to use the chat box right now and tell us what some of the myths are that you know of in Oregon or American history. So you'll see my cursor opening that up a little bit here. There are 400 of you, someone must know some myths. There we go. Yes, Tomaslet Cultural Institute, as someone is saying, is a great resource. They're amazing. Oregon is very white is one of the myths. Thank you for that. Columbus discovered America. <laughs> Oregon was a union state, so was anti-slavery. Oh yes, we are gonna get into that. That's a great one. There is equality in US democracy. Merlin is headquarter of KKK. The move west was an opportunity for all people. Oh, Rosa Parks was old and tired when she chose not to sit in the back of the bus. We had a great program about civil rights and Rosa Parks yesterday. That's a great one. Pioneers settled where no one was living. Only rural Oregon is racist. Thank you for that one. Land was empty, GI Bill was for all veterans, all of Eastern Oregon is racist. These are great. 
Oregon has current and past with the KKK. Oregon was a big KKK state. Individuals are responsive. Manifest destiny can be justified by the Bible. Oregon's a progressive utopia. Oregon is a, Portland is a high human trafficking city. Although we, that's a challenge these days to talk about. Oregon was never racist because they never had slavery. These are great. Some of the ones that we talk about in the work that I do as an editor, it, we're looking very closely at language. We try not to use the word wilderness when we're talking about the place that pioneers or American settlers came a couple hundred years ago. How can it be wilderness when people have lived here for thousands of years and tended and cared for and shaped the landscape? And, and we also try not to use the word settlers because the place was settled uh, be, be, before they came, so. Yeah, exactly. We think about equal opportunity as a myth or the vanishing Indian as a myth. That's one that Carrie talked about it, that you commonly see in museums like ours. Another one is, that's just what everybody believed then. That was just normal, right? There were a lot of debates about slavery for a long time. All right, thank you for, for playing along with our interactive. Oh, and there's, Eliza, there's a great one there. Those pushing for women's right to vote were pushing for all women's right to vote. Not all of them. No. <laughs> no, not at all. There was a lot of racism in that movement too. That's a good one. Well, Eliza, we'll talk about, about a few heroes here. Uh, you, you tell us about Hattie and I'll, I'll tell, us, uh, tell them about the next photo, so. Yeah, absolutely. So Hattie Redmond was a leader in the Oregon woman suffrage movement in 1912 which was the year of victory for Oregon women gaining the right to vote. Uh, it was on the sixth try. And actually black women here in Oregon were involved in suffrage advocacy as early as 1872. And Hattie Redmond uh, was the uh, leader of the uh, Colored Women's Equal Suffrage League was the name of it. And she also served on the statewide coordinating council. The 1912 campaign was won through a statewide diverse coalition of suffrage activists using modern campaign tactics. And we wanna make sure, one of the reasons we talk about some of these folks at the beginning of our presentation, is we're gonna talk a lot about oppression and racism, and we don't wanna give the uh, indication that black people, indigenous people, and other people of color have not been leaders and, and active agents in making Oregon the state it is for hundreds of years, and so, and their allies. And so we always want to take a minute to give some recognition and respect there. And then, Carrie, you're going to talk about that other photo. Right, the photo there on the on the right is a great photo. That is a young state representative, Mark Hatfield, in that photo in 1953. Uh, the first office he held uh, was state representative representing the Salem area. And Senator Hatfield uh, was, of course, uh, worked at Willamette University as a professor and the dean of men. And he would bring speakers out to the Willamette campus, uh, really well-known, nationally important uh, uh, African-American speakers like Marian Anderson, the singer, and Paul Robeson, the actor and singer, and was, was shocked and saddened when he could not find a hotel between Salem and Portland that would accommodate uh, Mr. Robeson or Ms. Anderson uh, because, of, because they were black. Uh, they had fought for, for years, uh, legislators had fought to get uh, open housing accommodation, public accommodation bill through the legislature requiring uh, hotels and motels to offer, open their rooms to all. Uh, it never passed. And finally, it was the leadership of State Representative Mark Hatfield that achieved the passage of the bill in 1953. And there he is with some of the leaders of the time, the, the civil rights, the, the black leaders in Oregon, including Verdell and Otto Rutherford. And uh, their daughter Charlotte is a good uh, friend of the Oregon Historical Society and a frequent uh, visitor to many, many of our events. And the Rutherfords led the NAACP for years and Verdell Rutherford saved many of the papers and other documents related to Oregon black history from early and mid 20th century that are now publicly accessible through the PSU special collection. So we love this photograph because you have this young, person who would become a, a huge part of national politics. And here he is surrounded by all of the community members who were able to work with him to make this significant change. So, 
So this is some of the work that we're bringing to you today is from our winter 2019 special issue on white supremacy and resistance in Oregon history, which is available for sale in the OHS museum store. <laughs> but this, uh, this quote here is from the introduction written by Dr. Carmen Thompson. And this gives you a framework, I think, that is really helpful. It's a succinct way of understanding this reciprocal relationship between white supremacy these are the racist structures that we're going to be talking about mostly today. And then the expectation that those structures engender in white folks over generations. So this expectation of top ranking, this expectation of privilege. And I think many of us who are white folks who would have been through some of these trainings will understand again that process of unlearning, that process of seeing patterns surfaced which have been subconscious in the world around us. And I would say for me, certainly learning history uh, has made these structures of white supremacy extremely clear. So I, I'm a huge fan of Carmen Thompson and her work, and we were really privileged to have the, her write and guest edit, co-guest edit this special issue um, and write for it. So this essay is available on our website. You can read the whole thing. I think it's really helpful. Um, but I'll just pause for a quick moment so you can take a second to read through this and think about it a little bit. All right. So this is when we were talking a little bit about that stolen land idea. Um, the Oregon Donation Land Act is what historian Ken Coleman refers to as affirmative action for white people. <laughs> so, and I think that um, I love this document because it's just this handwritten piece of paper, which is a tax receipt that helped this person, James Richter Poole, uh, lay claim to his Yamhill County land. And so the, the Oregon Donation Land Act was federal legislation passed in 1850. We have a ton of scholarship published about this, looking at it from the national perspective, looking at it as related to native sovereignty and white supremacy. Um, it's really a transformative piece of legislation for Oregon. Um, and it was given 320 acres per man or 640 acres per married couple with that half of th that 320 in the wife's name, which was pretty significant at the time. And per the legislation, that land was given to, quote, every white settler or occupant of the public lands, American half-breed Indians included, above the age of 18 years, being a citizen of the United States, or having made a declaration according to law of his intention to become a citizen. So that's the language, again, very explicitly giving this land to white people. That language about half-breed Indians is in there because of the many fur traders who had married native women and had sons here in Oregon at the time. And so they wanted to make sure that those men would be able to have access to this land. So over five years between 1850 and 1855, this law gave legal standing to two and a half, the transfer of two and a half million acres of native land to white settlers. And there were about 7,000 made claims made at the time. Note that no treaties with native nations here in Oregon had been completed and ratified at the time of this five years of transfer of land. All right. So uh, 1857, we'll, we'll, we'll cover some things here. 1857, uh, the Oregon Territory, uh, of course, more and more people are coming into Oregon than they they look to become, we look to become a state here in Oregon. Uh, so in 1857, 60 delegates, and of course back then uh, would have been 60 Caucasian men uh, gathered in Salem to work on a constitution uh, for the territory and then hopefully for the, for the state, a, a constitution was required for statehood. Uh, they wrote it and they sent it to a vote of the Caucasian men of the Oregon territory, about 10,000 of them uh, at the time. Uh, asking three questions. The first question was, do you approve of the Constitution? Overwhelming vote, yes. Second question was, when Oregon enters the Union, which we would, of course, on February 14th, 1859, should we enter as a free state uh, that bans slavery or a slave state uh, that allowed slavery? 
And by about a three to one margin, the Caucasian men of the Oregon Territory voted to enter as a free state. But the third question was, should we allow blacks in Oregon, period? And by an eight to one margin, uh, the answer was no. So the Oregon Constitution, when, when Oregon entered the Union in February 1859, we entered with a constitution that actually uh, explicitly banned all blacks from living in the state. We are the only state uh, to come into the Union with that in their constitution. Uh, it was never you know, really enforced to the full degree because the constitutional amendments that came in under, under Lincoln's presidency rendered it basically moot. But it remained in the Constitution until 1926, when it was finally removed by a vote of Oregonians. But you would be uh, saddened by how many people voted uh, against removing it in the Constitution, even in 1926. And the fact that it remained in the Constitution for some 70 years, sending the message to, to Blacks who had the motivation, or, the money to the interest to move uh, out of the South, to move elsewhere, to look for a place to live that would, would grant them more opportunity. And to see that this was in the Oregon Constitution, uh, you can imagine the detrimental effect it would have on them if, if anybody thinking of moving to Oregon. Absolutely, and this, um, this slide that's up now is the argument that Judge George Williams made for exactly that vote no slavery, no black people. And it's a very lengthy letter that was published on the front page of the Oregon Statesman on July 28, 1857. And I think one of the folks when we were talking about this myth, talking about anti-slavery uh, means pro-equality, right? Not in Oregon, not in this case. And so it's really a, a fascinating way that he lays out this argument. And really he's, he's laying out an argument um, for Oregon as a place for free white laborers. And this conflation of whiteness and free labor, uh, we see repeated over and over again, not just in Oregon history, but and not just in United States history, um, but in other places throughout the world, this comes up. And I think it's, to my mind, thinking about the essential workers and the unequal impact of COVID on Black folks, Indigenous folks, and other people of color it raises that question for me about how do we think about labor and who is entitled to what kinds of labor and what are the historical antecedents to that kind of entitlement. So again, we really encourage folks to read this whole letter. Um, our wonderful guest editors of the special issue made the connection. You see here that Judge Williams is making a claim about Black people's natural ability. This is very much echoing Thomas Jefferson's claims in notes on Virginia about black people's natural ability. Oh, and I also want to note, he, this, in that letter, he, he rails against abolitionists and, and blames abolitionists for uh, problems related to fights over slavery. And in Oregon at that time, there were abolitionists. And so these are people who were not just anti-slavery in Oregon as Williams were, but were actually seeking to end the institution of slavery. Um, altogether. And, and here are some of the, the notes uh, as the Constitution was being drafted uh, there, and uh, especially look at their Section 6, Eliza. How about that? So Yeah, exactly. And it's, this is fascinating. These, this draft, we have to make a plug, is cared for by the Oregon Historical Society. Beautiful scans of it are up on our digital collections website. You can look at all these documents. Uh, but here they are in Section 1. All elections shall be free and equal. And then in section two, they note that elections are for every white male citizen. In section three, no idiot or insane person, as defined by whom is the question. And then, of course, in section six, no Negro, Chinaman, or mulatto. So in but section they, but two, all elections are free and equal. So. All free and equal. Yes. So, and they make clear in section two only for white men. And then just for good measure in section six, we want to be real clear about who does not have access to the ballot here in Oregon. And this is, you know, one of several exclusions. As Carrie mentioned, the, the biggest one, exclusion of free black people altogether. There's also exclusions on property ownership here in Oregon in that 1857 constitution. And as probably many of you know, we've got the 1859 date up there because that's when 
the United States Congress ratified the Constitution and Oregon actually became a state after much debate. Again, that idea of, well, that's just what everyone thought back then. This Constitution, the, the racism in the Oregon Constitution fostered a great deal of debate in the US Congress about whether um, deciding whether Oregon should be um, brought into the, the union. It's, it's, course, yeah. Just say that's worth mentioning, of course, that as many of you know, this, uh, this is the centennial, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. And this week was the actual 100th anniversary of when uh, Tennessee became the 36th and uh, key state to, to enact it and to make it a, make it a part of our constitution. Uh, we have a wonderful exhibit up at OHS now called Nevertheless They Persisted, telling the story of the fight for women's suffrage uh, across the country, but more uh, importantly and relevantly here in Oregon. Uh, a, a great story. Five times it went to the ballot. Five times men voted it down. And finally, in 1912, on the sixth try, uh, Oregon men finally granted the right to vote to, uh, to women. Uh, so would encourage all of you, if uh, you have some time in coming months, to come up and see this really, uh, really inspiring exhibit. And we obviously are thinking about the, the broad history of voting rights, right? 1920 is one huge marker in that. Um, but also the 14th and 15th Amendments. The 14th Amendment is birthright citizenship and the Equal Protection Clause. And then the 15th Amendment, Amendment granted suffrage to Black men. Now, as somebody noted, there, was, there were big fights um, among national suffragists about whether to support that. And a lot of racism came out then with white suffragists saying, uh, why should black men get the vote before white women? In Oregon, those amendments, the 14th Amendment was not ratified by the Oregon State Legislature until 1973, and the 15th Amendment was not ratified until 1959. Mm -hmm. Now, despite all this racism, I do want to note that on January 1st, 1869, the, as they said, colored people of Oregon, the black folks who were here in Oregon, organized a large public emancipation celebration, celebrating the anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And George P. Riley was one of the speakers at that. And I always am amazed at the, um, the courage and resilience and just the impressive leadership of those black folks in Oregon in the 1860s and 1870s who were being visible about their celebrations. There were celebrations of the 15th Amendment as well when that was ratified, so. Okay, more racism. <laughs> you, you saw it in the letters where they specifically mentioned Chinamen uh, as you know not being allowed to vote. Uh, there were uh, a, a, a great deal of anti-Asian advocacy and violence uh, in, the, in the early part or the mid part of the 19th century. Uh, and uh, including probably the most infamous incident is the Chinese massacre, uh, the massacre of 34 Chinese miners uh, in Eastern Oregon. And there you see the memorial to, to these miners. Uh, Eliza, I know you have more details about that, so. Yeah, I mean, that is um, definitely an incident that's worth reading about. And it's what's significant. You can see there on the memorial, no one was held accountable, but folks did know who did it. And um, it's pretty gruesome, the, uh, the history of this, because there were bodies that went downriver. Um, and so when they were discovered in Lewiston, Idaho, this is when folks began to realize that something um, awful had happened. And so, um, but they were a group of young white men who had uh, committed the murders. And then uh, Greg Noakes, who was a journalist for the Oregonian for many years, uh, caught wind of this cache of documents um, in the county archives or in the county courthouse, I believe. Um, and someone helped bring them to light. And then he wrote a, a great book about that. We encourage folks to read about it. But this anti-Chinese and anti-Asian violence has a long history, particularly in the West of the United States. So after the Civil War, the US Congress was working on um, expansions to the Naturalization Act, wanting to make sure particularly that um, black folks who were immigrating to the United States were able to naturalize as citizens, as all of the free black people and freed black people uh, were in that time period. So they were trying to remove whiteness as a requirement for naturalized citizenship. And Western congressmen, including our friend George Williams, said, hold up, no, no, no. We have all these Chinese people and we don't want them to have access to citizenship. And they were successful. 
The Naturalization Act of 1870 disallowed naturalized citizenship for Asian immigrants. And that, that policy would not be removed until passage of the McCarran-Walter Act in 1952. So what that means is that all first generation Asian immigrants to Oregon until 1952 did not have the rights of citizenship. So that includes, of course, uh, the right to vote. Um, but that was also a way to put other restrictions on. Uh, in 1923, for example, Oregon passed an alien land law. So what that meant was that if you could not naturalize as a citizen, you couldn't own land in Oregon. So that was very directly targeted in particular at Japanese immigrants, many who were coming by that time and uh, building farms and orchards. Oregon was a big KKK state by then. The KKK claimed about 35,000 members in Oregon at the time. One of the other policies backed by the KKK was the 1924 uh, literacy test that Oregonians put into place so that if you could not read in English, you would be restricted from voting. And we at the Oregon Historical Society have in our collections a fascinating box of the literacy cards that were used to test voters uh, with so sections of the Oregon State Constitution of about 50 words. And, and one of the other ballot measures uh, Oregonian voters passed in the 1920s, KKK sponsored, was a ballot measure that actually banned, uh, required public schools, K through 12. It was aimed at banning the Catholic schools. The KKK were also uh, very anti-Catholic as well as being anti, you know, basically any minority. And Oregon voters actually passed that ballot measure. Uh, it never went into effect because the, it was challenged in the courts and the US Supreme Court would of course render it, would call it unconstitutional, which, you know, Certainly it was, but the fact that Oregon voters passed that in the 1920s shows you something about the influence that the KKK had back then. Absolutely, and the court rendered it unconstitutional because it removed parental choice about where they could have their, their children be educated. So it's a fascinating case. Okay, organized labor, bastion of liberalism, huge history of racism for organized <laughs> labor, uh, which we, um, and I, we can't help but make a plug. If you are interested in the history of xenophobia in the United States, uh, we would urge you to uh, buy a ticket to see a virtual lecture by Professor Erica Lee, who has a new book, America for Americans, History of Xenophobia in the United States. It's fascinating. We would have loved to have had her here in Oregon, but that's not possible right now. So you can uh, attend the program virtually on September 8th, find tickets on our website. Uh, I wouldn't plug it if it wasn't amazing. She's gonna be fantastic. Um, but her book also looks at this long history in the United States of the United States welcoming laborers from all over the world, but not wanting those people to have citizenship rights or economic rights in a lot of ways. So as we talked about Oregon, much like the West, there's a, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 uh, was also targeted at um, Chinese folks, obviously. And this slide shows uh, two different eras of racial discrimination by organized labor. So um, the Alliance plot fails, uh, headline here is from the Portland Labor Press, and this is thanks to the scholarship of Joanna Ogden. This is a 1906 article describing how longshoremen refused to unload, quote, coolie operated boats. And these mill workers refused to work alongside Asian laborers. So again, that coolie labor is also a reference to unfree labor. So again, that conflation of whiteness with free labor we see there. There was massive violence across the West targeted at Asian immigrants in the early 20th century. But I will say Oregon had from sort of British Columbia down into California, we had the least amount of violence. Um, so it definitely was here, but uh, Oregon leaders were really uh, interested in making sure that vigilante violence was not the way these problems were solved. Now they also didn't work for uh, justice and equality right, but they didn't want that vigilante violence. So in some ways, Oregon was a, a relatively safer place for folks. Um, do you wanna talk about World War II, Carrie? Sure, uh, World War II, uh, with the, the Kaiser shipyards uh, came to the uh, Portland area uh, during World War II. Many of the ships that uh, the US would use to, to win the war were, were built here in Portland. 
and it really was the first first large influx of African Americans, blacks who came into Portland to work in the shipyards. Uh, Mr. Kaiser was ahead of his time in, in many ways. Uh, he had, but he found uh, part of the, he had to build almost a new city, uh, which would be called Vanport to house the workers. And uh, for many of them, it was the only place for the, for the blacks, it was the only place where they could live. Uh, we'll be talking in a minute how that Portland was very heavily redlined. Uh, blacks were only allowed uh, to live in certain parts of the city. And so many of them had to, to move, in, move into Vanport. Uh, when the uh, war ended, uh, many of them stayed there. And then Vanport was uh, destroyed by an infamous flood in 1948. And uh, the, the black population there uh, had, to, had to find other places to live. And again, the redlining of the city forced them into just very limited areas. Absolutely. And, and, all, I, and I should add, I think there is the next slide, uh, Eliza, deal with the uh, Japanese. Yeah, well, we're going to we're going to go to. Yeah. Ex so World War Two, right, also was Japanese internment, incarceration, 120,000 Japanese sent into camps, uh, which I think this is a history that m folks are more familiar with. But 4,000 Oregon, Jap Oregonian Japanese people, people of Japanese descent were sent to um, concentration camps is often the phrase that people use today. And I think that's appropriate, although we historians want us to understand the difference between a concentration camp and a Nazi death camp, right? So we think about those things. Um, and I do just want to note one of the parts about World War II, folks are very familiar with women joining the workforce in World War II and then getting pushed out of the workforce. And uh, obviously we're coming out of the depression. A lot of folks were really working to get into that workforce. And in Oregon, there were huge fights in the shipyards with the labor union, the biggest one, not allowing black workers into the labor union. So this is a couple of problems. One, they're not able to get the higher paying jobs during the war, even folks who had been trained for these jobs elsewhere and literally brought into Oregon on trains by Kaiser, then were not able to get their union cards to do this kind of skilled labor. And then without that kind of skilled labor during the war, there's less opportunity to continue to advance in one's career after the war. And so the newspapers in Oregon are really filled with um, fascinating articles about these fights for people to get into the labor union during World War II and seeking uh, redress from the federal government and all kinds of things. Again, in our uh, white supremacy special issue, John Linder's got a great article about this. But we also note that as late as 1968, 26 black longshoremen filed suit against ILWU Local 8 for wrongly denying them promotion here in Oregon. So it's just an important reminder that this history is not in the distant past. It's really close to us. This, this, yeah, exactly. This is the Homeowners Loan Corporation map. Uh, you can look these maps up on um, the Mapping Inequality website, it's amazing. This is Portland in the mid 1930s. And I'll just give you a brief overview. Green is best, blue is still desirable, yellow is definitely declining, and red is hazardous. So these are maps that the Homeowners Loan Corporation used to advise banks on mortgages and whether to loan, um, loan more money for people to buy homes or to um, invest in their homes. So I'll tell you, I looked up um, my neighborhood. I live in the Foster Powell neighborhood here in Portland. It's included on the Mount Scott district. And the, the Hulk gave it a medium yellow grade. And this is what their assessment said. This area is heterogeneous in its makeup and is very poorly regarded. While the population is 90% American born, there are a number of families of subversive races scattered throughout the area. A limited number of Japanese, Filipino, and Negro families are known to reside here. There is also a scattered number of three and four room shack type dwellings and seven and eight room out, old outmoded structures. There are a number of blocks in the northern section, particularly along Powell, which would do credit to a blue area. This coupled with the fact that there is a movement on foot to rezone and make this section single family residential indicates that desirability is increasing in this part of the area and is the basis for according a medium yellow grade. So it's, it's 
fascinating to look at how explicitly Hulk tied people of color living in a neighborhood with that neighborhood being undesirable and also tying the single family zoning to being desirable. And I think many of you today who are involved in planning and policy around that uh, will probably be able to understand that in much deeper and more complicated ways than I can. But it's really you know, fascinating to look at this from uh, almost 100 years ago, exactly the data of how they did that. Um, we'll just note also, um, as Carrie noted, you can see the, the red areas of the North Northeast Portland neighborhoods that were traditionally black neighborhoods. Um, and then of course, after the Vanport flood, um, there, were, there was so much moving around of people, right? So after the Vanport flood, you had a series of events that I-5 cut through, et cetera. So we know that between 1960 and 1980, roughly 1,600 housing units were lost in Lower Albina, mainly in the Lloyd District and Elliott neighborhoods. Um, and that was because of all of these urban renewal and freeway construction projects, Lloyd Center, Memorial Coliseum, Emanuel Hospital, highways. So uh, with housing and neighborhoods comes Education discrimination, uh, where people live, of course, determines to a large degree on the, where you, the schools you go to, the public schools that are in your neighborhood. And Portland, uh, it's same as any other any other major city where you live. That depends on determines where you go to school. And there was a, a, a history of discrimination in, in, in the schools and the less desirable, so-called less desirable uh, schools and the less desirable neighborhoods. Uh, and it, this uh, erupted in the uh, 1960s and 70s uh, here in Portland with protests. That's Ron Herndon standing on the table, uh, one of the longtime uh, civil equity, civil rights leaders in Portland, uh, making his point there at a, at a school board meeting. Yeah, absolutely. There, there was only five years from 1867 to 1970 or 1872 that Portland had explicitly segregated schools. Um, but like many northern cities uh, in the era after Brown versus Board of Education, um, you know, or Portland simply declared it had no school segregation. There were just neighborhood schools. And this was the language that northern cities all across the country used to say, what? No, not us. We're not. We're not racist, but these are just neighborhood schools. But as we already know, neighborhoods are already tied to race, right? So there were the NAACP commissioned a study here in Oregon in the 1960s that demonstrated otherwise and offered solutions. Portland Public Schools did its own report and offered different kinds of solutions. Busing was instituted finally in the 1970s. More black kids were bused than white kids. The, the history is really one of a lot of, of pain and frustration. And I think j just when I was looking at this for this presentation, I went back to a quote from Catherine Hall Bogle, who was a black woman who grew up in many places in the West, but ended up graduating uh, from high school here in Oregon. And she had an Oregonian article in 1937 titled, An American Negro Speaks of Color. And I think apropos of our conversation today, she wrote about being in history classes and how they were particularly harmful. And she said, during this period, perhaps no rocks are thrown by hand, but there are subtle omissions, exceptions, and other differences made that wound the spirit. No attempt is made to help him to real pride of his own race. Rather, outside of his home, he is bombarded by assaults and propaganda against his race. So as we see the, the history of debates over school desegregation here in Oregon, much like the rest of the country, has a lot to do with not only where kids are going to school, but what they're being taught when they're there. And then of course, the, uh, the number one, the most uh, population, minority population in Oregon uh, is the uh, Latino uh, population. And uh, of course, there has been discrimination against them at, as well. Uh, here you see the, uh, some photos from the, the health clinics that were for the, the migrant workers, uh, and definitely not, uh, not up to the health clinics that you would, you would hope to see. 
Yeah, but these are, you know, com again, community created activism that really has pushed for change. And I, I know we're coming up on time and folks are chatting. So we'll just fly through a little bit these last couple of slides. But we always want to remind folks that the, the state line of California and Oregon used to be the US Mexico border until 1848. And we know that Latinos are listed in the Oregon census from as early as 1850. So again, just really encouraging folks to learn more about that history. We have a long history, yeah. Yeah, one of the issues, of course, that we've seen over the past several months is the uh, protests against uh, the police violence against the black population. And it's been uh, a story here in Portland uh, as well for, for many years. And Eliza, you have some more specifics, I think, on that. Yeah, well, this is Captain Walter O'Dell, who was a member of the Red Squad during the 1930s. We see historically there's some overlap between explicitly um, what we would now call white supremacist or even fascist groups, such as the Silver Legion and the American Defenders, overlapping in some ways with the police departments. Um, and I think that's important to recognize. And then we also see just lengthy, lengthy community advocacy that's very much like what we see today. These protesters here are in 1985 seeking to ban the chokehold. So I think that's really important when folks are de having debates now about how do we reform police departments? Do we tear them down and build them up again as something new? Looking back at what the community advocacy has been and what the patterns of problems have been is really helpful, I think, in understanding what those policy decisions are. Um, so that was, a, so that I should say, uh, Tony Stevenson was killed by Portland police. Um, it was a mistake. He uh, was a black man who had helped um, uh, break up an altercation. He was an off-duty security guard. And when the police arrived to provide assistance, as I understand it, he was the only black person there and they put him in a chokehold, um, which is how Eric Garner was killed in New York some years ago. This is a photo from 1946. Uh, the Coon Chicken Inn was a, um, was a restaurant here in Portland on 54th and Northeast Sandy. And the, the image on the right is the menu uh, that we hold here in our collections. And Dr. Milner wrote, from the 1930s to the 1950s, Black Oregonians endured the constant reminder that it was acceptable in a white supremacist society for their race to be publicly debased and humiliated. So we include this because we want folks to think about what are the ways that cultural depictions then help reinforce those ideas of whiteness that then help reinforce the structures of white supremacy and really to think about all of those uh, feedback loops. And I noticed on the chat uh, that there were several conversations going on about the fact that still in Lincoln City, Oregon is a, is a restaurant named Little Sambo's which of course, uh, it's been there for 63 years. And of course, uh, not a uh, inclusive name for a restaurant, of course, referring to a, a, a character from a children's books. Uh, and it's, I'm, there's been an effort uh, to get the restaurant to change its name, but it, as of now, uh, Little Sambo still exists down in, down in Lincoln City. So I, someone has a great question here about whether there were black indigenous or people of color professionals available to do this presentation. And that's a, that's a great question and one that we struggle with here at the Oregon Historical Society a lot. Um, we're definitely interested in bringing more folks onto our staff, um, absolutely. And then also are happy to share out information um, and suggestions for other speakers. We also think it's our responsibility to be folks who are stating this history clearly. Um, but I think it's a, this, that is a tough one for us because we feel the need to take responsibility for talking about this history and also wanting to turn the mic over to make sure that folks are hearing this history from Black, Indigenous, and people of color as well. So thanks for raising that question. Um, somebody wanted to hear about Beatrice Morrow Canada, who was a uh, an incredible activist here in the early 20th century. Um, she was a person who was a publisher and an editor of a black newspaper, The Advocate. And one of the things that she did was organize um, activists to resist showings of the birth of a nation here in Portland. 
um, because that film was um, so incredibly racist. Um, and it was a film that lauded the KKK and depicted um, horrific uh, stereotypes about black folks that of course put black people in danger by fostering those stereotypes. Um, and we definitely encourage folks to learn uh, more about her as well. So thank you to whoever it is who that's their, your hero. Uh, we agree completely. Uh, Japanese uh, Americans were sent to camps in 1942. Um, so uh, FDR uh, put out executive order 9066 which enabled the um, rounding up and placing in camps of Japanese and Japanese Americans um, within a certain uh, distance from what they called the war zone, so on the West Coast. Um, but Issei, first generation Japanese immigrants, began to be arrested by federal agents as early as December 8th, 1941, so right after the uh, bombing of Pearl Harbor. And the, the person who mentioned Bernice, uh... Beatrice Morrow Kennedy, C-A-N-N-A-D-Y, someone is asking about the name there. Uh, a project uh, sponsored by USA Today and was joined in by the Statesman Journal in Salem, uh, in honor of the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote, was they asked each state to provide a list of the 10 women of the century, uh, 10 really influential and inspiring women of the past 100 years. Uh, Oregon, uh, there was a Blue Ribbon panel that helped in the selection of Oregon's list and a few names on the list of, of interest. One, of course, was Beatrice Morrow Kennedy, uh, for all the reasons Eliza just mentioned. Uh, also on the list were Catherine Harrison, uh, one of Oregon's most important tribal leaders. Uh, Catherine was, uh, was uh, known as the leader of the Tribal Council of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. Uh, she was the chair and uh, really one of the most influential uh, leaders of, of, of Oregon tribes. And then uh, Margaret Carter. Uh, many of you might know Margaret. Uh, she uh, was the first African-American woman ever elected to the Oregon State Legislature, served in the Oregon House and Oregon Senate for many years, was deputy director of the Department of Human Services, uh, was, her, was her final job in there in Salem, but uh, a very, uh, very inspiring and influential and historic figure in Oregon. So let's see, I think there's questions in the Q&A, but it's not allowing me to look at that with my screen still shared, so. So I Eliza, just... one was when were black women actually able to vote in Oregon? So black women gained the right to vote in Oregon along with white women in 1912. This is such an important question. Um, because of the 15th Amendment allowed, um, okay, so the 15th Amendment made it so that it was illegal for states to explicitly restrict voting on the basis of race. We all know that Jim Crow policies and also tremendous violence, including uh, lynching and torture and murder, kept a lot of black people from voting until the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. In Oregon, we know that black women registered and voted after that 1912 victory um, because we had their voter registration cards in public archives. There's also an incredible photograph from 1916 that Dr. Kimberly Jensen found in the Oregonian of a woman named Mrs. Amanda Garvin, who was emancipated from slavery. And there's a photograph of her literally at the voting booth voting. And the caption talks about um, her attention to issues, not just for women, but in particular for black women. And you see that again and again and again with black women um, leaders, suffrage leaders and other leaders in Oregon, including Mary Beatty as early as 1872, going to take direct action in an attempt to vote. This is the same direct action that Susan B. Anthony took in 1872. And then Mary Beatty spoke at the first statewide convention of women suffragists in 1873, explicitly talking about the importance of the ballot for black women. So that is, um, I think, important to keep in mind. Now, then, of course, there's the 1924 literacy test, which Oregon was um, very nativist. So that 1924 literacy test is targeted at uh, folks who don't read English. And in that um, wonderful caption and that photograph of Mrs. Amanda Garvin, one of the things that it says is that she does not read herself, but other people read to her. And so she's very well up on all of the politics of the time. Keep in mind, of course, that in many places it was illegal to teach enslaved people to read. So you see these various insidious ways, we're seeing them now, 
uh, uh, in ways that maybe we never would have imagined um, that folks seek to restrict access to the ballot. So we wanna be clear that black women were able to vote after 1912 and did vote after 1912, but that there were ways that um, folks sought to keep them and other people from the ballot. I noticed a question, can you talk about OHS's commitment to racial equity and how you in internally deal with racial equity concerns? Uh, recently, we, uh, we engaged Margaret Carter, Senator Carter, to conduct a, a, a DEIA audit, diversity, inclusion, uh, accessibility, you know, for uh, audit of OHS. Uh, she was given free reign to interview all staff uh, privately and, and board of trustees and volunteers and supporters, uh, what we are doing well, what we could do, be doing better and all, all the diversity uh, and inclusion areas. And so Margaret issued a report and we are uh, acting on that now. And that's just one way that we are uh, working to make sure that we are addressing concerns and we are committed to telling the history and stories of all Oregonians, uh, uh, regardless of uh, you know race, color, creed, uh, and, and our programming uh, under Eliza's guidance is dedicated to making sure we're reaching out to uh, all populations in, in Oregon. Yeah, th these are conversations that are a big part of our field in general. And so our colleagues are thinking about um, what is the metadata that we use um, to talk about collections and that kind of thing? And also, what are the resources of the Oregon Historical Society and how do we get those resources um, so that we're using them to highlight the voices and histories of folks that institutions, including ours, have historically oppressed? So it's a lifelong work that we have to do. Well, well Andrew, it's 9.56, I see. 9.57, is there... Uh, a question you have to, to wrap it up or anything you'd like to, to offer and just thank you again for inviting us to do this. You are, we have, Liz and I have done this on several occasions, but you are the first state agency to ask us to do this. So kudos to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Carrie, Eliza, and Sarah very much for, for doing this. I know I speak for everyone. I say I learned quite a bit over the last hour. Uh, a lot of comments coming in wishing we had more time to speak and Maybe we can talk about a, a follow-up presentation as well. Uh, you know, Eliza, you, you said something that really struck me. You talked about your responsibility for telling this story and mm -hmm. getting this out. I think all of us have a responsibility to listen and to learn uh, as well, and to, to take this information that we have uh, and make some positive change with it. So uh, for those of you at, at DCBS, uh, you've hopefully already seen an email inviting you to a crucial conversation uh, uh, seminar next week, the DEI Council, we've organized this. Uh, it'll be next Wednesday, uh, I think Wednesday, but August 26th from 10 to 11.30. It'll be a great opportunity to follow up and, and really dig into these things uh, with each other and to continue this really important conversation. And looking at Andrew, looking at all the really very nice, thank you very much, all the very nice, uh, compliments coming in. One question I see is, can we access the recording presentation materials? So I think that would... Yes, we, we will. We, yes, there, there will be a recording. Uh, once we get that, we'll make that available uh, on the DEI Council website uh, and be glad to share that with our other agency friends. And the, power, the PowerPoint as well, I think you'll be sure. Too, so. Absolutely. And we can, we can send you a bunch of, of links and things as well. We just really encourage folks to spend a bunch of time on our website and the Oregon Black Pioneers website um, and, and many others. You can, there's a lot of great stuff to learn. And I would be uh, guilty of uh, malpractice as the uh, executive director of OHS if I didn't quickly mention that, hey, uh, go to www.ohs.org and become a member of the Oregon Historical Society. Uh, with the membership, you receive all the, the e-blast, the phenomenal material we send out. Uh, and of course, you also get a subscription to the Oregon Historical Quarterly, which is worth it uh, just, just for that, to see the uh, fascinating uh, peer-reviewed scholarly articles on Oregon's history that are in the OHH, OHQ four times a year. Well, Thanks again. for hosting us. Thanks for all the Thanks. work you do as public servants. We're grateful for you. Thank you all very much again. And thank you everyone for joining. We had uh, well over 500 people. So thank you for listening and look forward to continuing this conversation with everyone. All right. Have a great day. Take care.